everyone, welcome to Cal 2. Today is the day your mathematical life changes forever. Today is the day we do the seemingly impossible. If I were to ask you to find the area of that rectangle, it's a simple matter of saying length times width. In this case, C times B minus A. Now, how in the world would I tackle something like this? Let's say I got a parabola boy, say Y equals X squared, and I want to find the area sandwiched between the graph and the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. How am I going to go about doing that? Is that even humanly possible? Well, I guess we'll have to find out. Area for now is a question mark. But how about we start by approximating this area with rectangles. Let's take n rectangles, capital N rectangles, they all have equal width. We're going to shoot them straight off the x-axis, and I'm going to make sure I draw these evenly. And for starters, I'll start with four. One, two, three, four rectangles of equal width shooting off the x-axis. And you can see, if I add up these four rectangles, that will give me an approximation of that curvy blue area. So maybe there's some fruit, something fruitful lies in this path here, but for n equals 4, this is not really a good approximation. Look at all that blue space left over, so how about I go up a notch to n equals 8? Again, I shoot off 8 rectangles of equal width right off the x-axis. I'm going to shade them on in red. Shade, 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 and um, yeah, keep going, keep on going, three more, two more, and one more, and I am done. Now this, ooh, with this I feel like I am getting somewhere, and we are getting somewhere. N equals eight, we are getting somewhere for sure. How about we take things up a notch even further. How about 16? I know that sounds quite quite risque, but the more the better. 16 rectangles shooting right off the x-axis on equal width. Look at them go. Look at them go. I can't even count how many are left. They're so thin. 4, 3, 2, 1... Now this is a good approximation of that blue area, if I do say so myself. Of course, it's not exact. We got the little, the little bits of open space, but n equals 16 is pretty dang good. Pretty dang good. So you can see where I'm going with this. As capital N approaches infinity, the area in red approaches the exact area in blue. Now... Before we deal with the tricky calculus -y and approaching infinity case, we should first deal with a simple finite case. First, let's say n equals 8, just to get some proper notation, the appropriate notational apparatus on the table. Ooh wee, here we go. Again, this graph is the graph of x squared. We're going to let a equal 3, b equal 8. That's our starting x value and our final x value, where we're trying to sandwich the graph in between. With those lower, that lower and upper bound, I want to approximate the area in blue with the sum of the rectangular areas. And here I've labeled them a1 to a8. Again, that's 3 and that's 8, replacing the a and the b with numbers. Now this weird-looking l, the even weirder subscript n, this stands for the left Riemann sum with n rectangles, or formed through n rectangles. Essentially, all this fancy uh, phrase means is that we're going to form n rectangles of equal width between A and B, whose left endpoints have to touch the graph of F. That's where that L comes from. The left endpoints must touch the graph of F. And I've indicated where they touch in green on the graph. I'm also indicating the equal widths delta x. I've labeled all the delta x. So notice, notice uh, if 
that whole length is b minus a. And if delta x's are all the same, then each delta x must be b minus a divided by the number of rectangles. That's a formula you're going to want to know very well, right there, the green star. So the left Riemann sum is just a1 uh, adding all the way up to a8. And here in white are my heights. The first height is f of 3. The second height is f of 3 plus delta x. That's the second x-coordinate f of 3 plus 2 delta x is the third x-coordinate. You can, get, you can count these on the picture. f of 3 plus 3 delta x is my fourth x-coordinate. 3 plus 4 delta x, my fifth x-coordinate. And so on and so on and so forth, all the way to my final x-coordinate of 3 plus 7 delta x. So f of 3 plus 7 delta x is my final height. Now, we already know delta x. That's, in this case, 5 eighths. Now, we just have to calculate the heights the whites, and those whites are given by simply sticking 3 and delta x with the appropriate constant into x squared. That's what I'm doing down, down here. Those are my first four heights underlined in white. Next, similar way, I'm just rounding to the nearest thousandth if I can, and doing this all the way to my final point gives me Let's see here, 54.391, there we go. Those are my all eight heights for my left endpoint rectangles. My left endpoint rectangles. Now I'm dealing primarily with numbers, only with numbers, and all the fancy notations gone. I just have some decimal numbers to crunch, going all the way out to my final x-coordinate. And by the way, notice in the picture, we didn't use that final delta x. There are eight delta x's, but I only use seven of them. Um, that's because we're dealing with left endpoints. This sum comes out to be approximately 144.08, with the heights are indicated in white. Now then, let's look at that intermediate expression there. That, that guy right there. That, that fella. This is a very important expression, and I wrote it in this weird way for a reason. You can write it compactly using summation notation as follows. But actually first, let's uh, expand it out a little bit, and I'm going to emphasize the number of delta x's in red. f of 3 is the same thing as f of 3 plus 0 delta x. f of 3 plus delta x is 3 plus 1 delta x. And the rest I'm just changing the 2s and the 3s and the 4s to red. So you can emphasize something crucial. Of course, I'm adding up the areas of 8 rectangles. I'm adding up 8 rectangular areas corresponding to one rectangle. That one corresponds to the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th rectangle, 6th rectangle, 7th rectangle, 8th rectangle. Now compare the numbers in red, the 0 to the 1st, the 1 to the 2nd, the 2 to the 3rd, that lets me condense that entire sum into a nice summation like so. And note the i minus 1. a in this case was 3, but I can generalize now. A nice general formula is like so. This will always work for any function, for any starting value a. That's our general formula for the left Riemann sum. And analogously, and I'll draw it up on this picture in a second here, for a right Riemann sum uh, with n rectangles, our first x-coordinate is going to be a plus delta x. Not uh, a, our first x-coordinate is a plus delta x um, for, for the x-coordinate of the first uh, height that touches the function. So i instead of i minus 1, since, for example, with n equals 8 and a equals 3, the height of the first rectangle is given by f of 3 plus 1 delta x, not f of 3, as in the case of the left Riemann sum. And the height of the of our eighth rectangle for the right Riemann sum is going to be f of 3 plus 8 delta x. And note the differences between right Riemann sums, summation-wise, and left Riemann sums, summation-wise. And I've drawn this on the picture as well. Now then, so really nothing fancy going on here. I just added up the areas of eight rectangles. Um, 
So why all the need for all the fancy notation? Well, how about we deal with a situation where we're not dealing with a Riemann sum using a small number of rectangles? What if n was a big number, like n equals 50, and you wanted to find L sub 50 for the parabola with the same uh, starting and ending x value? Now, notice in the previous problem, um, we had to compute eight function values. Uh, and that was pretty tedious in itself, but imagine 50, imagine 100, imagine 1,000. Do you want to manually find all 50 of the function values here? f of 3 to f of 52 in this case? No. Just, uh, just no. And if you said yes, then, uh, hey, smart Alec, how does L of a million sound? Huh, gotcha. Instead, the better way to proceed is like so. And I'll go to another spread of blackness. I will use my summation notation to the fullest. Start with him. I'll note my a, b, and delta x values, 3, 8, and 8 minus 3 over n, which is 1 tenth, and I plug them right on in. Delta x is a tenth, appears twice. f of x is x squared, so I can get rid of that f in my summation by squaring that input. 1 to 50 of that entire thing squared. By the way, keep things as factored as much as possible to minimize the math that's about to happen. That 1 tenth, I'm going to pull that on out. I have to FOIL that squared term. And using FOIL, 9, 2AB, 2XY, there we go. i got to FOIL that little guy. A FOIL within a FOIL. Look at that. 9 plus 3 fifths I minus 3 fifths plus 1 hundredth of that familiar fellow there. How about we combine like terms? Combine the 9 with the 3 fifths. I'll combine my i's now. 3 fifths, 1 fiftieth. And uh, yeah, combining like terms, numbers, i's, and i squareds, gives us this. Now you're moving, what, what in the world can I do with this? Well, rewrite that summation in terms of just powers of i. So just summation, powers of i, everything else on the outside. So I'm going to yank on out, well the 110 I'm just going to keep it way out there, but I'm going to yank out that uh, 841 over 100, I'm going to yank out the 29 over 30, and I'm going to yank out the 1 over 100. So I can have summations of powers of i. This is summation of, from i1 to 50 of 1, which is i to the 0. Now I have a summation of i in pink, I have another one of uh, i squared. And again, one is i to the zero. Now, why in the world did I did I do something like that? How do we get rid of the i's? This is where an unexpected friend swoops in to save the day. Number theory. Who would have thought number theory would appear in geometry and calculus and analytic geometry? Well, I mean that's a basic one. That first one, uh, summation rule. But when you add up the first n numbers, their sum is always going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. But here's some examples. Um, for the first rule, and for the second rule, which may be more unfamiliar, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 is 28. And it turns out that is the same thing as n times n plus 1, 7 times 7 plus 1 over 2. And that formula is confirmed. Likewise, if you add up the first n cubes starting with one, or sorry, squares starting with one squared, one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared, for example, that is going to be just evaluating the left side on its own terms, thirty. But compare that to four times five times nine all over six. That's also thirty. So this this formula is confirmed. Um, not proved, but confirmed. And uh, same thing with the sum of the first n cubes starting with one cubed. 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube plus 4 cube. That's my example here. That's a nice 100 on the left side. Does that equal 4 squared times 5 squared over 4? Indeed it does. And the formula is confirmed once again. By the way, I'll probably do a separate video proving these for you. Because, uh, I mean, really throwing out examples and showing that examples work isn't a full-blown proof. But for now, we will take them as 
intuitive givens. These allow me to rewrite those summations without summations. For example, the summation of uh, these three here, one, i, and i squared, I can get rid of my summations entirely. You won't see any summa summation symbols now because I replaced that first summation with just the number 50, that second summation with 50 times 51 over 2, and that third summation with 50 times 51 times 101 all over 6. No summations anymore, just numbers. What do we get? Oh my, 42.05, 73.95, 42.925. We throw these together and we get the approximate area between the graph of x squared and the x-axis using 50 rectangles. That's, that's crazy. And now notice, as n is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, for either a left Riemann sum or right Riemann sum, we are approaching the actual area. That's because the widths are basically becoming like line segments. They're just becoming little slivers. Little slivers that just are matching the exact area. So how do we do this limit process? Well, we're going to do the same thing that we, that we just did for that n equals 50 case. But we're not going to substitute 50 for n. We're going to leave n as it is. And again, the algebra is going to be a little nasty, but at the end, it'll be worth it because we'll have a nice formula for any n, for any number of rectangles. So I will substitute a with 3. I'll also substitute x with, uh, again, 5 divided by n, where n is just staying as it is, a general n. And now I algebraize my summation formula. Once again, I foil. Got to be a little careful. 9 and 2 times the products plus the last one squared. And that 5 over n is just hanging out at the end, minding his own dang business. Um, that's That fellow is a 30 over n. That golden boy down there is a 25 over n squared. I follow that little guy's little tyke hanging out in front of the 5n squared. And now in violet... I don't know what color, but it's a nice light purple. I simplify. I just do a, bit, a little bit of algebra, getting rid of all my parentheses, and everything's being multiplied by 5 over n. And again, I am highlighting the i terms in pink, because those i terms are the key to getting rid of my summation symbol. Now, breaking it apart, 45 over n, the first one, the second one gives me that, the third one gives me that for my, uh, there's no i in that one, but there is an i squared in the next one, and then a plain old i following that, plain old i, there we go, and then finally just a number at the end, just a number at the end. Now, we need some room to gallop. So again, remember, this is the left Riemann sum formed with just a generic n rectangles. I do what I did before. I want to rewrite this just in terms of powers of i. So 1 in pink, and no i to the 0. i to the first, 1 or i to the 0. i squared. Yank on this, that stuff. Get an i. And I believe I have one more. There we go. And that first one just becomes n times 45 over n. And I'm just subbing my right sides of my number theory results. The right sides of those number theory results, remember on the previous page, had no summation notation in them. Summations are gone. Look at that. They're gone. There's not a single summation in sight. This is a summation-free zone. We like summation-free zones. Um, summation symbol freeze. I mean, the summation is still going on, technically. Well, there we go. Just algebra a bit. Algebra a little bit. That middle one, though, that n plus 1 and uh, 2n plus 1, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to not bother with that right now. But everything else, I'm going to break apart. That's what I'm doing here. I get 0 for my last two terms when I add them together. 
I combine some numbers, I get 120, combine the 1 over n terms, I get negative 200 over n. So all in all, look at this. I have just derived a nice, nifty formula for the left Riemann sum for any generic m. For example, if I stick in 50 into this formula, I should get what I got when I just did it numerically, and voila, out pops what we got last time. What if we go up? What if we go to 100? Now our area is getting closer and closer to the actual area, my friends. Mm, I should have put an n squared. Okay, there we go. 160.294. What if we throw in 1,000? Ooh, let's try that on for size. What's going to happen? Uh, no, it's, it's, doesn't seem, it's not growing that much, but it's getting closer and closer and closer to the actual area. Closer and closer to the actual area. So where are these numbers going? They're getting to the uh, they're getting to the actual area. They're approaching that actual area. They are stampeding towards it. How do we find that actual area? Well, okay, let's uh, let's stop beating around the bush. Let's get right to the calculus. All we have to do is take that nifty formula we derived and let capital N go to infinity. Let the violet go to infinity, and we got three things that we need to. We need to let go to infinity, 120 and 200 over n, and that ungodly thing at the end there in violet. Well, I chose violet because it's a pleasant color and it's soothing for this cumbersome task. Okay, first two limits, 120 and 0. Now, what in the world is that guy? Well, let's just take him piece by piece. Um, maybe you know this off the top of your head if you know the little trick in Cal 1 with coefficients, but if you don't know the coefficient stuff, rewrite that product as a sum, then you can rewrite... That fraction is three fractions, each of which can be simplificated. Simplificated. Oh my gosh, 250 over 6. Then the last two have ends, and they boo boo boo, they go, they go down to a, they go down to Hades. And there we have it. Our final answer, the exact area, no rounding, nothing. The exact area under the parabola from 3 to 8, sandwiched between the x-axis and the parabola, that exact area right there is 970 over 6. No weird decimal, nothing. Appreciate how much of an infinite expansion this is to your geometric capabilities. In geometry, you were limited to you know circles, squares, and rectangles, but with calculus, no more. And I mean, notice also, this is very close to a L of 1,000. And moreover, this area is symbolized in calculus textbooks by that integral from 3 to 8 of x squared dx. But why? Why is that here? Why is that a thing? What on earth does area have to do with antiderivatives and integration? That's so random. Or is it?